So far in our course, we've been stressing Paul the letter writer. In other words, within our five hermeneutical principles, we've been giving emphasis to the literary approach. So we've finished with that, and now we're going to spend a bit of time uh, emphasizing the historical approach. So instead of Paul the letter writer, we're going to focus on Paul the missionary. And uh, the idea is, is that before we get into the rest of our course and uh, we get more information about specific places and historical details, we don't want that information to get lost. And so we need a basic framework to start off our study of the letters. And so this presentation is meant to summarize what an understanding, a chronological view of the Apostle's life would look like. So here we go. We start off with a quote from Ray Brown, a rather important New Testament uh, theologian who passed away just recently. Primarily a Johnine scholar, but uh, wrote on a lot of other parts of the Bible as well. He says, and this is in answer to the question, why study Paul? Why even have a whole session to focus on the Apostle Paul as a person, as a man, or in this case, to highlight his missionary activity? And he answers that question this way. Next to Jesus, Paul has become the most influential figure in the history of Christianity. Although all of the New Testament writers are working out the implications of Jesus for particular communities of believers, Paul, in his numerous letters, does this on the widest scale of all. That range, plus the depth of his thought and passion of his involvement, have meant that since his letters became part of the New Testament, no Christian has been unaffected by what he has written. And then this crucial line, whether or not they, that is, we Christians today, know Paul's words well, through what we believe have been taught about doctrine and piety, all Christians have become Paul's children in the faith. I don't know if you've ever thought of yourself that way, that you are somehow a child of Paul. A good analogy would be just... Uh, our understanding of our own family and background. In order to know who we are and to understand why we are the way what we are and how we act or react, it's helpful to look at our family history because we're largely shaped and influenced by our parents, our family, and uh, the particular context in which we grew up in. In a similar way, if you want to understand Paul, our spiritual father, we need to know something about him and his life and how we ought to hear his letters. Now, in the study of Paul's life, we need, of course, some sources to use, and it's important to distinguish, as some scholars have done, between primary and secondary sources. Primary sources are, is a term usually used to describe what Paul himself has written, and then secondary sources is a reference to what others have written about Paul. So, for us, especially Acts is the, by far the most important document uh, to learn in addition to what Paul himself has written. Now, many of us, I think, are writing to uh, broadly evangelical churches and ministering in quite conservative places, at least places that typically treat Scripture as the inspired and authoritative Word of God. And so this may not be an issue, but it nevertheless is important for you to be aware that in academic circles, it is very common to make a distinction and to drive a wedge between primary sources, Paul, which supposedly are historical and reliable and can be trusted, and secondary sources, such as Acts, which many would like us to believe are really theological treatises. In fact, Luke is so interested in theology that he, according to this view, creates historical events in order to suit his theological purposes. And so there's a widespread skepticism within many academic circles about the historical reliability of Acts. And although this is not the time and place to enter that debate because there are some very good and important responses given to that question. I do think it's very important for you to realize that uh, if you pull a commentary out, for instance, off of your bookshelf, right, that commentary probably reflects that perspective. That commentary reflects a distrust of Acts and the information we may learn about churches and communities and Paul from that document. And so um, it's important as you use these resources uh, that you recognize that this kind of bias against Acts uh, exists. I don't share that particular bias. I'm, I do think that there are differences between primary and secondary sources, but um, for all kinds of reasons, I think that uh, one can not only trust Paul, but one also has good plausible reasons to trust the writer of Acts, Luke, as well. And so I'm using both of those sources and other biblical and extra-biblical sources in my reconstruction of Paul's life. Now you may know and remember from uh, the assignment that I've taken all of pa Paul's life, and I've divided it up into 11 
categories, right? It's too big a blob of information for us to handle if we treat it all as one thing. And so it's helpful to think about Paul's life in 11 different categories. And uh, I'd like to work, walk with you through some of those categories. Some of them are going to spend more time on other. Uh, some will be quicker because I'm assuming you'll be able to fill in the details on your own from the reading. But there are some things and some aspects of Paul's life that aren't so clear from the reading or maybe not taken up at all in the reading and nevertheless are important. And so I'd like to highlight those in uh, this uh, and my subsequent presentations. So the first uh, category uh, that we're going to use to think of Paul's life is the category Paul's early years. And the first thing within that category is we want to know where he was born. And you can see here from a bunch of texts that he was born in the city of Tarsus in the province of Cilicia. Hopefully from the slide you can see where, um, maybe I can do that here too with my key, you can see here where Tarsus and Cilicia is located. Now, Paul says about his home city an interesting statement in Acts 21, 39. He says, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Isn't that a striking phrase? When was the last time you said uh, of your hometown, I'm from so-and-so, no ordinary city? Well, that phrase is indeed significant because uh, Paul is quoting the phrase no ordinary city from Euripides, who used it to describe Athens, which was indeed an important, unique city in the ancient world. And that phrase hopefully draws your and my attention to the fact that uh, Tarsus, maybe a city we're not familiar with, nevertheless was a well-known and significant city in his day. It was a well-known commercial center, it had quite a thriving economic base, and also was an important university town with one of the major schools of philosophy uh, originating from this place. And it was also located in an important crossroad of travel through this part of Asia Minor. And so the takeaway for this is Paul doesn't come from just some hick town in the middle of nowhere. No, he comes from an important city, right? No ordinary city, the city of Tarsus in the province of Cilicia. Now, early on, Paul left there and he went to Jerusalem for his education. We read that because he says uh, in Acts that he was brought up in this city, namely Jerusalem, and I studied under Gamaliel. And if you heard that, you might go, ooh, because that was indeed impressive. Gamaliel was a well-known, respected Jewish leading scholar of that day. In fact, Acts itself acknowledges that fact. Acts 5.34 says, Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people. And so one way to think of it is that Paul went to the Harvard School of Judaism. He trained at the feet of the important rabbinical uh, leader, uh, Gamaliel. Now, this fact uh, says something about Paul's background and heritage. If you take the analogy of him going to a Harvard School of Judaism, it's not easy to get into Harvard, is it? You have to have uh, certainly good grades, but you also have to have, most would say, uh, some clout, right? You have to come from some important family. And so this is yet another indication, the other being Paul's citizenship, which we'll talk about in a minute, but this is another indication that Paul comes from a, a wealthy, leading, or powerful Jewish family in Cilicia, in uh, Tarsus. Now, scholars have been interested with whether or not Paul came to Jerusalem either as a young boy or as an older, well, as an older young adult. And the reason they're interested in whether he went early as a young boy or as a, as a, as a later teenager is they, they thought supposedly this would tell us whether Paul is looking over one shoulder for his influence or another shoulder. What are the two shoulders? One would be a Jewish background. So when we think of Paul, should we understand him primarily as a Jew and one who approaches all of life from the Torah and the Jewish scriptures? Or should we think of Paul kind of responding from a Hellenistic, a Greek and Roman background? And the old way of thinking was, well, if Paul uh, stayed in uh, Tarsus, this rather cosmopolitan, important uh, pagan city in uh, the ancient world. If he stayed there a long time, well into his teens, well then obviously he was heavily influenced by his Greek Hellenistic background. Or the opposite, if he went to Jerusalem as a young lad, well then, oh no, that would be different. Uh, he grew up within the conservative sphere of Judaism and we should understand Paul primarily from that religious background. Now this dichotomy, this way of understanding Paul is uh, frankly a false one. 
In other words, it assumes that there are two kinds of Judaisms in the first century. What has been called Palestinian Judaism, that is the collection of Jews who lived in Palestine, and it was believed that they must be conservative and orthodox, true Jews. And then you had this other group, quite a large group actually, uh, Jews who were scattered living outside of Palestine, usually given the name Diaspora Judaism. We've got a couple million Jews in Egypt. We have a couple million Jews in Babylon uh, area. We have a million Jews living in Asia Minor. There are actually more Jews living outside of Palestine than there are inside. And the old way of thinking, there was an assumption that, again, uh, Palestinian Judaism, the Jews living in uh, around Jerusalem and the temple and the area, they must be conservative and Orthodox, and then the other Jews living among the pagans, you know, were influenced by all of the dangers of living in that pagan environment, and they must be more progressive, they must be more liberal. But that analogy, or that kind of assumption, simply isn't true. It's not who, true historically, it's still not true today. I'll use an analogy uh, from today before I talk about the ancient world. You might think that, wait a minute, we have all these Christian Reformed and Reformed people living in West Michigan, right? This heavy concentration of Reformed, CRC, and other people living here in West Michigan. So therefore, you know, anybody over here must be like really conservative and Reformed through and through. And then the opposite would be we have all these Reformed and uh, Christian Reformed people living far away, you know, in Canada, different parts of the states, and, and they're only a minority, and they're out there living among the liberals, the pagans, and therefore they must be somehow more liberal. But actually, that's just not the true. In fact, it's quite the reverse of what is actually true. If I'm a Christian Reformed person living in Canada somewhere, in some other place in the United States, other than maybe Michigan or Iowa, I look around and I would say, you know, boy, there aren't many Christian Reformed people over here. And in fact, when I tell people I'm Christian Reformed, they, they, they're kind of puzzled. They're like, who are, who are you? And are you some kind of group or cult? or? You know, you're somehow bad that you have to be reformed from whatever you're bad. And, and so I have to make a decision pretty quick if I'm living in diaspora Christian reform land, if you will, to, 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 to decide whether or not I'm Christian reformed. In other words, I have to be very conscious about it. I either have to accept it and, 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 uh, and, and think about it and buy into it and, and kind of live that way, or I beg it all together. And actually, the, re the same thing is true, but in reverse here in Michigan. I've been living now in uh, West Michigan for, for 20 years, and everybody around me is Reformed or Christian Reformed. The people at my church are Christian Reformed. The people at my work are Christian Reformed. The people in my neighborhood are Reformed or Christian Reformed. And as a result, I don't have to think very much about what it means to be Christian Reformed. And because of that, therefore, it doesn't mean much for me to be Christian Reformed. And so I hope you see it's a false dichotomy to assume that somehow all of these concentration of Jews and Palestinian Judaism would be conservative and the diaspora ones spread out around the world would be liberal. And so getting back to Paul, that doesn't really help us. If indeed Paul grew up in uh, Tarsus, it doesn't really matter whether he left town young or old. Uh, he would have been influenced by living in that kind of world, but he might have still been quite conservative. His family might have made some conscious choice to live as Jews in that environment. Or if Paul went to... Uh, Jerusalem already as a young boy, uh, that doesn't matter either because we have all kinds of evidence that uh, Hellenism, a Greek and Roman way of life, was making big inroads into life in uh, Palestine. For instance, um, we read about how Jews were changing their name in Palestine from Jewish names to Greek names or how uh, everybody was so interested, that is Jews now, wanting to go to the gymnasium, right? The place where people run around gymnos naked, right? And it's not just an exercise place, that's where we have the public baths, and that's also where you go for education and learning. The gymnasium in the ancient world is kind of like the, the classic Hellenistic uh, institution by which those Greek and Roman ideas are celebrated and advocated. And wait a minute, when we go to these gymnasiums and run around naked, either for exercise or for the baths, well then, people see that we Jews are circumcised, and that makes us feel a little self-conscious. And so, some of us are even going to undergo surgery, as painful and difficult as that might be, to hide our circumcision. And so, I hope you're beginning to see from this quick uh, little description that... Um, that uh, the Jews in Palestine uh, were, in a sense, heavily influenced by the Hellenistic world they lived in. And so it doesn't really help us uh, when we think about Paul in terms of whether he grew up as a kid in Jerusalem or he came there only as, uh, as, a, as an older teenager, a young adult.
The better truth is, is when you think of Paul, he's both. He's looking over both shoulders. If you scratch him, if you push Paul, his Jewishness will, so to say, bleed out. He first and foremost is a Jew, and so you have to know something about Judaism and his Jewish faith to understand the Apostle Paul. So he's looking over that Jewish shoulder, so to say. But he's also looking over his Hellenistic, his Greek-Roman shoulder, because he knows that he's writing mostly to Gentiles, right? He is an Apostle primarily to Gentiles. He's got Jews too, but and that means that he has to think very carefully about what it's like to live in a Greek and Roman world. And, and so that's also a big part of understanding the Apostle. Well, that took a little bit, but those were some important points for us to understand, not just about Paul, but about uh, our understanding of the Greco-Roman world in which Paul lived and ministered. Now, in addition to his education, right, uh, a, a Jewish background, we, we know what religious group he was affiliated with. He was affiliated with the Pharisees. Now that may not mean something to you if you're one of those people who kind of treats the Pharisees no different than the Sadducees and the Smadducees and all that kind of ease groups, you know, who gave Jesus a hard time that we read about in the Gospel. But if you do some study, it wouldn't take long to recognize that there are different groups or parties or movements within Judaism, and they have lots in common, but they also have some things different from each other. And you might learn then that the Pharisees are, well, they're an interesting group of people. They're lay people, so that means that they're different than the Sadducees, who are a priestly party. So the Sadducees are a priestly party. Their power base is the first T, the temple. The Pharisees are a lay party, and so their power base is a different T, the Torah, the law. And the Pharisees said to themselves, wait a minute, in the Torah we read that uh, God came to uh, Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, and, and gave us our marching orders, right? Uh, God told us then in Exodus 19 that we were to be, what, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So they thought about that. God wants us to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And they said, well, okay, well, we're not priests, literally, because we're not from the right priestly family, but... Even though we're not from a priestly family, we're going to live as if we are from the priestly family. In other words, we're going to voluntarily submit ourselves to the roles of holiness that the priest have to follow. So I hope you're beginning to see that if you're willing to think that way and live that way, that you must be pretty conservative. And, and Paul belongs to this conservative Pharisee group. You can also see the conservatism of the Pharisees in their name, Pharisees. There's some debate, of course, about its meaning, but the most widely accepted meaning is it comes from the Hebrew root parush, which means to be separated. You just think about that, you know. Say, hi, my name is Jeff Wyman. I belong to the separated party. Whoa. I mean, that, that means that I, I feel pretty strongly about that. I want you to know that I don't belong to maybe you or to anyone else. And, of course... This means that the Pharisees not only separated themselves from non-Jews, Gentiles, that meant that they also separated themselves from fellow Jews, right? Their fellow Jew, Jews who, who didn't take the rules for holiness and God's Torah as seriously as they did. And again, this is the group to which Paul belongs. But he's not only a Pharisee, he's a zealous Pharisee. It's interesting that both in Acts, the secondary source, as well as in Paul's letters, the primary source, we have these references to him being zealous, right, zealous. Now, right away, when Paul identifies him that way, you have to look over his Jewish shoulder. Not surprising to understand that. That's an allusion to the story of Numbers 25. All Jews know about the story of Numbers 25, and it's an embarrassing story uh, in our history, but that's when... Uh, the, the men of Israel were sleeping with, they were having sex with, the women of Moab. In fact, we read about how this one Jewish man took a Moabite woman and kind of paraded her in front of the elders in a brazen way and, and took her into his tent. But then we read in the story how Phineas was filled with zeal. That's right, filled with zeal. And he took his spear or sword and he pierced the two, the men and the woman, together in the act. And then what's God's judgment of what Phineas did? We read this. He, that is Phineas, and his descendants will have a covenant of everlasting priesthood. Why? Because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. That's pretty significant. 
In other words, when you kill somebody, you're not just killing somebody. If you kill them for the right reason, then you're not only even scoring points with God, right? You're actually atoning for the sins of your people or your nation. And so this is a pretty scary mentality for a person to have, and this is the mentality that Paul had. He was a person who was filled with zeal, a person who was willing to do anything, even murder, because it's not murder. He's atoning for the sins of his people. A good analogy um, uh, took place uh, even in contemporary times, not that many years ago. One of the former prime ministers of Israel, I think it's Yitzhak Rabin, if I remember right. Uh, he was a big advocate for peace and trying to establish a peaceful relationship between the Jews and the Palestinians. In fact, he got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. Well, there was a peace demonstration a number of years ago after all this happened, and he was assassinated. He was killed. And whom was he killed by? Well, he was killed by an Orthodox Jew, right? Somebody who was ultra-conservative, somebody who was filled with zeal. And who was this Orthodox person? He wasn't just some some hick, you know, some dummy, you know, that somebody brainwashed into uh, doing this uh, murderous act. No, he was a young, well-trained, educated lawyer. And his family wasn't uh, upset about what he had done. No, they were proud about him, right? Because his son, following the tradition of Phineas, you know, uh, was zealous for God and his honor and was making atonement for, for his people. And so again, this is the way you ought to think of Paul before he is uh, dramatically converted by Christ. Or to say it as I said earlier, Paul's a pretty scary dude if you're a first century Christian, right? He's a guy who's not only knowledgeable, he's a guy who's well connected, he's gone to the Harvard School of Judaism, and he's filled unfortunately with zeal, right? He'll go anywhere, do anything in order to make atonement, with, you know, no matter what that means negatively for the earliest Christians. And this naturally leads then into the next category, explains why Paul is indeed a persecutor of the Christian church. That's the first time we meet Paul in Acts. Acts isn't a biography of Paul, right? He doesn't show up until chapter 8, and he's holding the coat and approving as uh, Stephen, the first martyr for the Christian faith, is described. But Paul himself, in his own letters, acknowledges, right? Galatians 1, for instance, You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Yeah, that sounds like the kind of zealous Pharisee that we've been talking about. And he talks about it again in Philippians and in 1 Timothy. Paul was a persecutor of the church in his early years. Another question, it's a, a little more laid back than the intense question of Paul persecuting. It's just a question, what did Paul look like? But it does relate to understanding Paul, I think, better and his ministry. And the way to get at that, uh, now we don't have very clear sources, so this is, I, I'm whispering, this is a bit of educating guesswork, but there is some clues about his appearance. The first clue comes from his own words, where Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, For some say, right? Paul acknowledges that there are people critical about him. There are some people who say about me, right? His, that is, my letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. What's going on here? Well, in our course we have a reading uh, that involves some reflection on the business of rhetoric, right? How people were trained to speak well. And this was a huge deal in the first century. It was a sport, a competition. It was a big part of getting ahead in life, right? To win people over with praise and to speak in a way that convinced them that you were right. And in the speaking contests that they had, they were actual speaking contests, it was important not only that you spoke well, but that you looked good, you looked pretty, that you looked fit. If you were maimed in any kind of way or deformed, that was, you know, that was a big strike against you. And we know from uh, non-biblical sources that rhetoricians, speakers would shave, for instance, the body hair off of their uh, torsos, and they would put kind of oil on their bodies, somewhat like weightlifters do today, in order to accentuate their muscles and their positive appearance. And so here we have a hint where Paul himself kind of acknowledges that, okay, some of, there are some people out there, I guess in Corinth, who say, okay, we grant you Paul's letters are pretty impressive, right? But in person, he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. So his actual speaking ability isn't very great, and actually in appearance, right, in person, he is unimpressive. And uh, we have something uh, like this idea 
not so much in the church today, but uh, you know, a generation or two ago, sometimes people would talk about a minister, and they would say, you know, he's got great PP. They wouldn't say PP, but they, he's got great pulpit presence. You know, just somehow he exudes a sense of authority and trust and so forth. And the other clue that we have that Paul wasn't too uh, good looking is not only this hint from his own words, but then also uh, from a, a second century source. So we have to be careful how we use it. It's much later and also it's obviously written by a person who, who has a romanticized view of Paul. But he says, uh, and he saw Paul coming, a man small in size, bald-headed, bandy-legged, of noble mien, with eyebrows meeting, rather hook-nosed, full of grace. Sometimes he seemed like a man, and sometimes he had the face of an angel. So if this text were believed, we see that Paul isn't very large. He's a small person, and he's bald-headed. And it's interesting that all the iconography, you see the images I have of Paul are all the same. Kind of like me, he's got a receding hairline, right? He's bald-headed, as this text says, and he's got eyebrows meeting. We would say in contemporary terms he had a unibrow and a hooked nose, but then the Christian over-spiritualized part comes out, right? Full of grace, and sometimes he seemed like a man, and sometimes he had the face of an angel. In fact, um, a German uh, uh, expert, this is kind of like CSI, uh, I tracked this down a few years ago in German, did a kind of facial reconstruction of what Paul likely looked like, and you can see the image that you have here before you. And maybe this also helps us better appreciate the challenges that Paul faced, right? Given his appearance, given his background, and the difficulty of coming into a strange town and, and trying to win people over to the truth of the gospel. Well, so far then, we've covered one category, Paul's early years, and I've spent a lot of time on this. We'll spend less time on most of the other categories. So we leave Paul's early years. Actually, we're not, sorry. We have a few more things to, to talk about, and they're important too. So, and that is his Roman citizenship. Now, there are three ways that you could become a Roman citizen. You could either inherit it through your parents, and that's apparently how Paul got it, you could do something great for Rome and be given to you as a reward. Maybe that's what happened to his parents, right? Or thirdly, you could buy it. Maybe that's what happened to his parents. They were rich enough to buy it. That's what happened on the, to, the, to, the, to the Roman uh, kind of leader who rescued Paul at the temple, right? In the third missionary journey when Paul comes to town with this huge offering and he goes to the temple and they think the Jews there, the non-Christian Jews, think that Paul has brought a Gentile into the inner courts which, which a person was forbidden on penalty of death to do. There were signs written there in uh, both, uh, both Hebrew and in Greek and I think also in Latin. And We have actually one of these signs recovered which is pretty amazing in the museum in uh, modern day Istanbul. And so the, the, the crowd that descended on Paul then and were surely doing him harm, they thought that he had brought this Greek into the inner part of the temple. Anyway, so he was kind of rescued by the Roman uh, garrison that was situated there. And then that commander says to Paul, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, right? Uh, how did you get yours? So there are three ways to become a Roman citizen, and Paul inherited it through uh, birth. And again, another indication that he comes from a wealthy and likely influential family. I have an image here of somebody wearing a toga because uh, only Roman citizens could wear a toga. I didn't realize that. Years ago, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, we used to have toga parties, right? And uh, I couldn't have wore a toga because I wasn't a Roman citizen. But Paul was, and uh, that was a big part of his life and ministry. Because it, it, you have to know that, that makes sense of what happens to him in Philippi. He wasn't there very long, but uh, that's a big part of the incident, uh, Paul's arrest and uh, bad treatment there. It also is part of the Jerusalem incident we just talked about a minute ago, explained why he was rescued and why he was squared away in the middle of the night for his safety and also part of his appeal once he was in uh, Caesarea. But Paul makes reference to his citizenship a number of times uh, in uh, his life. And this also explains uh, why we should think of him when he's under imprisonment, maybe in different ways than you perhaps did before. Maybe if you're like me, I thought at one time that Paul was in jail, bars, chains, and all that kind of thing. But now we see that being a Roman citizen entitled him to certain privileges, right? Even under arrest. So he was more under house arrest. And you can see that both in Acts 24, that describes the Caesarean imprisonment. We read there that, uh, that to give him, that is Paul, some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. 
And the same thing is true when Paul appealed to Rome. He ended up spending a couple years or maybe more in Rome, right? He could still entertain guests, right, from his different churches. Paul could still carry on his prison ministry, if you will. I had this image of, of Paul kind of being like a, a mob boss, right, who's uh, arrested maybe on some tax or some trifle matter, but even though he's under arrest in jail somewhere, he's still behind the scenes controlling things, you know, out in the real world. And Paul, in a more positive way, is doing the same thing right along the way. So he may not be able to go out and literally preach the gospel and visit these churches, but he's writing letters to them. He's responding to their letters to him. Uh, he's sending some of his emissaries out there. Paul's engaged in a kind of prison ministry, not to fellow prisoners, but he's carrying on his ministry, even though he's in prison or, more accurately, under house arrest. And all that's possible because he's not a regular guy. He has a privileged position of being a Roman citizen. And indeed it was a huge privilege. I was just reading a, uh, a secular text from the ancient world a while ago about the governor, a very important uh, person in the island of uh, Sicily. And he uh, accidentally, well, I don't know, accidentally, he, he crucified a person whom he found out later was a Roman citizen. And this was like a huge no-no and he got into big trouble for that. And so uh, this actually makes sense when people find out that Paul is a Roman citizen, uh, like in Philippi, uh, they go, ooh, our bad, uh, you know, let's just pretend this thing didn't happen, and why don't you guys just leave town? And this also affords him some privileges, which Paul takes advantage of in Caesarea in terms of his appeal to Rome, Paul's citizenship. Yet another uh, thing we ought to think about in those early years is that's the part where he was apparently trained with a skill. This is not surprising given his Jewish background. It was very common for um, for uh, leaders, right, uh, in the Torah, teachers and so forth, to also have a trade or a skill. And Paul apparently worked with uh, leather, and this becomes a big deal in his life. For instance, in uh, the second missionary journey where he ends up in Corinth for a year and a half, and he connects naturally with Priscilla and Aquila, this Jewish couple from Rome who were kicked out of Rome because of Emperor Claudius's decision or edict. And then they have this common bond of of uh, leather working and, uh, and, and they also engage in ministry together. But Paul does this, this work with his own hands, uh, this self-sufficient work, not only um, uh, uh, you know, just to provide for himself, but he does so to avoid, I think, a common accusation meant against him, and that is um, people claimed because Paul's going around speaking, you know. Paul, people claimed, people opponents to Paul, would claim he's just like all the other wandering teacher philosophers of that day. They're like the used car salesmen of the ancient world. People who say anything, do anything for a buck or to win people's praise, which will ultimately get them a buck. And so Paul seems to be kind of hypersensitive because he was seemingly charged a number of occasions with this very fact, not by Christians, but by non-Christians, right? Questioning his integrity. And this explains why Paul is kind of sensitive about churches sending him money and the need for Paul to work for himself. I say that because, for instance, this text from Acts 21, what's happening there? Well, Paul is on the return leg of the third missionary journey. He has skipped deliberately Ephesus because he's in a hurry, but he he leaves word. He sends someone to Ephesus, tell, take all the elders from Ephesus to come join me in Miletus, a little farther south. So the elders make a, it's a one or two day trip. It's a good little hike from Ephesus to Miletus. And then Paul has this farewell speech to them. And, and part of the speech to them, notice, notice that he seems to be very defensive, saying, you know, uh, you know better. I, I didn't, you know, I work with my own hands. I, I didn't try to sponge off of you in an inappropriate way. Acts 21, 33, 34 says, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Why does Paul say that? Because some were accusing him of coveting their silver, gold, and clothing. And he goes further, You yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. So it's kind of striking that in a farewell speech, Paul still feels the need to clarify to these Ephesian elders, Wait a minute. You know, I wasn't selfish. You know, I didn't sell these things just to kind of get free room and board and housing and to snow you and win you over, to win your money and praise. No, no, no. I worked hard with my own hands. And this becomes a big deal in his letter, two letters to the Thessalonians too. Because in the Thessalonian church, there are some Christians who were sponging off of the generosity of Christians and weren't working. They said, this is a pretty good deal. we got these Jesus people over here who give us free food, free housing. This is great. I don't have to work ever again. And so uh, Paul warned them about that. And then he appeals again to his own example. 
So Paul's self-sufficient work is not just a way to defend himself from the accusations of others, but it also becomes a powerful example. Say, look at me, right? I could have held up my apostleship card and said, you know, this entitles me to free housing, free food, right? I'm entitled to this because of my status as an apostle. But instead, Paul voluntarily, in a very kind of self-sacrificial way, works night and day, as he says to the Thessalonians, in order not only to be a burden to you, but also to provide an example for you to follow. And some scholars go one step further, if I might say, um, and they say that this is important because, as we said a couple of times, Paul comes from, seemingly from a wealthy family, a powerful family, and he comes, you know, with a powerful status. And though we in North America maybe respect somebody who's not afraid to get their hands dirty and to kind of work themselves up the corporate ladder, you know, from a menial job to something very important, that wasn't really the attitude toward work in Paul's day. And it still isn't the attitude toward work in many cultures of the world today. The attitude then, and in many places today, is anybody who works with their hand is kind of negative. That's kind of pejorative, right? And there's a very strong distinction between lower class and upper class. And lower class people have to work with their own hands. And, and some have argued that for Paul, to work with his own hands is, a, is kind of an important humbling of himself, right? Because most of the Christians, most of the converts would have been from that lower class. And, and Paul is kind of an evangelistic strategy powerfully kind of gets down at the level where most of his uh, converts are at and he provides an important example for them to follow. I have here also this text from the King James Version because uh, it can often be misunderstood. Uh, maybe people don't quote the King James too much anymore but on the other hand they still do and so this mistranslation is important to correct. Um, if any would not work let him not eat. I had a very wealthy uh, person uh, who was traveling on one of my study tours uh, told me about this saying. He was kind of proud. He had a plaque on his desk. He said, you know, I have here in the King James Version, right? If any would not work, let him not eat. And you know, had it right on his desk, you know, because it was kind of, I think, a manifesto for him. You know, that the other people are lazy and unlike him, he's work and he got this position. And so I thought it was important for me to uh, correct him. Uh, and say that actually the Greek doesn't say if any would not work. The Greek says if any will not work. The idea of wish or volition. You see, Paul is not against people who want to work but can't. Right? Maybe they've got some physical deformity. Maybe they're laid off. But you know, he's not talking about people who, who have a desire to work but for whatever reason are prevented. He's talking about people who have a conscious, stubborn, willful rejection of working. And he says if anybody's like that, let them not eat. And so there's no justification in here to be uh, unsympathetic, to be uncaring toward those who, for whatever reason, right, because of physical deformity, because of economic uh, difficulties, are unable to work. Well, friends, I'm just looking at the clock, and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, so far introducing this subject and uh, looking at Paul the early years. We'll take a quick break here, and then we'll look at the remaining 10 categories uh, that help us to understand the Apostle's life, Paul the missionary.